Hello there, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages. My name is Mr. Dogba333, and welcome back to Parts 9 4, New World Last Days of Europe as the Republic of Guangdong. Well, the state of Guangdong, we're not a republic, we're not even vaguely democratic. Not, not, not even, well, maybe vaguely, but only if you have money. Um, in the last video, we finished up our misadventures in with uh, Mr. Takuji. We invited Yasuda and Cheong Kong into our governments, and we're going to check it out. So, we'll check out Cheong Kong first. When Li Kaixing left Sony's leadership to King and team in 58, many Japanese executives hoped it would end in the Moria Lee and the Moria to lead partnership that had upended Guangdong. They were sorely mistaken. Now head of Cheong Kong Holdings, Li, now head of Cheong Kong Holdings, had merely shifted his attention to the providing the necessities of modern life for the Chinese masses, a sorely undeserved market. Supermarkets, pharmacies, wholesalers, and cinemas, Cheong Kong had its fingers on the pulse of the poor Zhujin in Chinese communities, across Ch Guangdong, an escapable presence in the post Yasuda landscape. For Lee, doing good and good business are one and the same. For nobody should experience what he once did. Want as he once did, rather. Especially not if they can profit from making sure they do not. So, eight members of Jiang Kong, opposed to Hitachi as 14. Created in 1910 as a manufacturer of electronic mo electric motors, Hitachi is, is the electronic subsidiary of Nissan Zaibatsu, itself assumed under the Manchurian Industrial Development Company, the preeminent state-owned company of the Empire of Manchuria. Backed by the Manchurian state and its captive workforce, Hitachi has a presence in nearly every segment of the electronics market. Hitachi's chief executive, Komai Kenichiro, is a man both familiar and alien to Guangdong's tycoons, blending a shared emphasis on technology with a devotion to total control and state intervention that is anathema to Guangdong's more freewheeling capitalism. To many, Komai is a reminder of a darker time of total mobilization for the state, a Manchurian agent that has come to haunt Guangdong. Not a good guy, but he is the guy in power. And here we go. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to save real quick. Just because I don't know what exactly is going to happen. We'll just uh, keep on keeping on. It's here. It's them. The fluttering pink banners, the blaring gongs and cymbals, and the dazzling confetti and vermilion gold paper mache lions are dancing their way to Chung Wan's boulevards and alleyways, bringing the wonderful, wonderful news wherever they go. Cheong Kong's Enterprise's most recent nationwide sales campaign, the most extravagant in entire history, has gone to full throttle. While Matsushita, Fujitsu, and Sony Glitter high and mighty from the skyline below, Cheong Kong prefers to dominate the ground below. It's a pink laced supermarkets, pink laced warehouses, and pink laced housing agencies. The impeccably dressed salesmen and saleswomen stand, greeting curious passerbys with the cheeriest smiles and answering their inquiries in equal parts spotless and endearing Cantonese. The instant, the instant the murmuring, consenting nods begin bubbling up, so comes the time to show those potential customers and recruits inside, and gift them a well-deserved tour through column after column of catalogs and positions available offers. Zhujin, Chinese, it doesn't matter. In Cheong Kong, there's a place for everyone. If our Japanese noble, however, is perfectly forgiven to spit on it all and go about his day. Yeah, sure, he would snicker. As if Li Kaching would have pulled all that money into this crap and not hitchhiked into the Legco on Marita's back. It's all just one giant merchandising ploy, one pitiful attempt by that little factory owner to cater to the bottom half of the pyramid. He'd be entirely right. Where else would Li, Li native-born son of Guangdong, answer to the woes and interests of those he owed his fame, fortune, his entire existence to? Right now, at least the grumbles and jeers wouldn't reach Lee's ears anyway. Before the mirror, within his chamber, the Zhujin tycoon stood, adjusting his tie one last time under the early morning lights. Wouldn't hurt to look snappier. From now on, after all, there'd be plenty of special meetings to attend to look forward to. Money makes the ghost turn the mill, indeed. Well, there we go. I 
if we downsize the Kenpai Tai, that would give us control in the Mai. Something interesting to think about. And the OFN prevails in Madagascar. Cargo trucks laid scatter on the line, greeting La Lam Hao Chun just as they bid him farewell so long ago. Men hurling the bundles of oysters on the freighter cars, too, went on without so much as a frown upon their faces. Business as usual, it seems, just as Ah Kyung had told them. But then Lam stopped on the gas pedal and plunged further onto the array of houses and shanty towns, and merely the facade of normalcy tore itself clean off. Greeting him now was a sight of deceived men in workwear weeping at the doorsteps, of bandits roaming the roads with clubs and torches in hand, and everything he saw only fueled the anxiety simmering into his heart. He hadn't received a single letter from back home, not for an entire year. Two hours longer for Kowloon Koshu Railways, and another on the dusty railroad, just to find out why. Seizing this long overdue seven pay respite from his nightmare of a post, but somehow he wasn't sure that he wanted to who anymore. It was only natural he kept muttering to himself, but shitstorm of Yasuda spares no one. After all, the small seaside village, fishing village, he called himself home, had its fate chained firmly to the dazzling metropolis of Hong Kong, only a river, plus a carpet fails away. The Pearl had devoured truckloads of men from the village's homes without remorseful, remorse or reward, leaving those who'd been left behind in woeful yearning. With no choice but to cling onto the paychecks scattered in the winds and whatever else the faraway men in suits cared to spare them. Is it any wonder, then, that the instant the great city above the clouds goes up in flames, everyone else burns with it? It was only natural, yet he kept muttering as, as his aged patrol car inched towards his destination, and he felt his muscles tensing up and trembling. Whatever was going on at home, he had no way of knowing. Why won't they at least give him their reassurance, assurance, assur, assurances, I can speak, to let him know they're doing fine, or is there even, even anyone left there to write the letters at all? Naja crept up Lom's stomach as he braced himself for whatever whores awaiting him. No, it isn't natural. Whatever's going on over there, heavens, please let them be safe. Then his loved ones came into view, and he sighed a brief sigh of relief. Chief Executive Matsuzawa Takuji and Council General Takashima Masuo sat soundly in their seats, eyes shifting from each other to the floor to anywhere else. Now, I was particularly keen to open today's meeting, a formality observed for the sake of formality, even as his collapse had robbed both men of their time and sanity in equal abundance. Even though Guangdong's performance this year has fallen short of what we discussed last year, I think we would both claim extenuating circumstances are to blame. Chief Executive Matsuzawa Takuji nodded silently, shifting, stifling a bitter chuckle at Takashima's assessment. Even if Tokyo proper had been supremely unhelpful, having Takashima acknowledge the utter bedlam that had followed Yasuda's collapse was more than what he'd hoped for. Be that as it may, Tokyo has communicated that they will expect Guangdong to do its part in the Spears' economic recovery. Takashima looked exhausted. Having spent most of the past year fighting for resources from Tokyo, even as Japan pl itself plunged into economic and political meltdown, Chief Executive Matsuzawa Takuji had hoped this coming year would be slightly easier for them both. Now that the Yasuda collapse was behind them, the company started looking back to the future. The air in the room remained heavy and still, even as the clock ticked restlessly onward. We should get back to work. So we need 24.2 billion by the end, or by the start of next year. Lom met the incandescent glare of his second oldest uncle of a tide of confusion crashing upon him. Right back? What was he even on about? He opened his mouth, but then he saw the pen and paper laid on the wooden table and, table and hit him. They'd been writing to him the whole time. The mail blackout had simply had been simply because none of the mailmen would want to do their job anymore. Relatable Lam sighed. I'd love to write back, uncle. It's just that none of the letters ever found their way to- Stop bullshitting me! The giant callous laid laid hands, yanked on Yam's collar, and secretly Lam wince. Moss stood up, tears welling in her wrinkled eyes. Brother, please. Fuck you and your nonsense, Lam ha Chun. <sighs> Insolent fucking disgrace. Thinks he can just dine merrily with those jackals on his own family's corpses. If only he'd so 
you if only you if you never sold your soul soul to. He turned his gaze to the badge upon Lamb's shoulders, to the golden bathina gle gleaming under the sunlight, to that thing. Roars turned into sobs as the man collapsed onto his knees in tears. Lamb stood wordlessly, numbness washing over him once more. Bahina, yes, a blessing and a curse. His salvation from Hong Kong and damnation to Koshu. The thing that gifted him his new life, yet kept on erasing his old. A hybrid, a bastardization, like what he, Hayishi Kosen, had chosen, had become. He lowered his head upon, he lowered his head and surveyed himself. Single stroke of lapis along the gray tattered canvas. Uncle was right. He could have easily ridden home on his own volition without waiting for anyone, anything from them. He could have shown he cared. He never bothered to, had he? Lamb screwed his eyes shut and kneeled to the ground too. He could feel it. Bit by bit, he was beginning to leave his roots, his loved ones behind. Bit by bit, he was beginning to forget. We don't have political power. So we're just going to have to uh, hang tight for now. <clears throat> we extend a warm welcome to our newest colleagues from Cheon Kong Enterprises and President Li Kaxing. Voice of Chief Executive Matsuzawa, increasingly ignored in anything but a formal capacity now that his days were so clearly numbered, was quickly drowned out by the sudden cacophony in Legislative Council's chambers. The cheers from Sony's supplicants, the jeers from Fujitsu's followers, the pocket of silence from that Jushida's men. Reactions seemed amplified to Uli Kashing as he stood to be recognized, bound twice to the assembly before sitting down. As the session closed, Li walked up to each of the tycoons, paying his respects to each in turn. Welcome to the Legislative Council, Matsushita said non-committally, nodding his head politely with a pl plastic smile fused his face. If you're looking for friends, I'm afraid you're in the wrong place. There's always time for good business. You finally made it, Kashing. Marietta had come looking for him immediately afterwards, beaming from ear to ear and clasping Lee's hands jovially. It all starts from here. Finally, Lee pushed back his hesitation, pulling his feet before Abuka, who looked upon him at his seat, arms folded. I suppose I should compliment you for pulling yourself up this far, but I'm afraid I'm not such a sentimental man. Here's some advice as your new colleague. Don't disappoint me. Fadai Kun from Chion Kong will find his voice. <clears throat> Yoshiko sat wearily on the creaking mattress, surrounded by faded wallpaper, the ever-present dampness, her perspiration indistinguishable from the humidity of the unveiled room. This was a new accommodation in a good Zujin district, with a single Spartan wooden table on paleolonium flooring next to a gas stove she barely knew how to use. In the days after her father's body had been consigned to a local Japanese temple, Yoshiko had thrown herself into calling publishers, magazines, newspapers, gossip rags, where it didn't matter. She was sure that if she stopped, her money would surely run out before her grief. It got nowhere. The Zujin copywriters had no need for a Japanese woman, and the Japanese, Japanese editors withdrew off her fresh male graduates from Tokyo. At which end, she'd bucket, bucked protocol and stormed into the offices of the last name on her list, the Canton Fujin Koron, a women's magazine offering fresh perspectives for Japanese readers. The receptionist was none too pleased that Yoshiko had no appointment. Yoshiko, in desperation, dug in her heels. Literally. As the security had come to drag her away, she played her last card. I'm the daughter of Baron Yasukawa, and I demand to see the editor! Silence. The receptionist looked at her like she'd grown two heads, while the heads head on the editing floor turned disbelievingly towards the commotion. She felt her cheeks flush from the attention, the embarrassment, and the realization that nobody really cared. The beat of approaching footsteps shook her out of her mental haze, along with her pro offered head, hand, and insincere words. Mrs. Yasukawa, I'm so very sorry of your loss. Your name and story would be of great interest to our readership. She swallowed her pride and accepted everything that came after. More as hell. And now I bid our fa farewell to this honorable institution. Let us once again uh, offer our Sincerest welcome to our compatriots from Hitachi Limited of Manchuria, joining us in our collective endeavors and the Pan-Asianist cause. 
for who wouldn't? The neat 45 degree bow, the all too brilliant smile, the sheer courteousness emanating from the orchid emblem line emblem lined jet black suit that would leave even the most seasoned of Matsushita's cronies in Oz and awe. Take even the slightest glance at Komai Kenichiro. And you could tell the man from a sing meant business and the best kind. Yet underneath all the applause and sincerest welcomes among the Sea of Guangdong's elites lured the usual fears, the usual skepticism, bundled with an unspoken consensus. For stone faced Manchurians don't belong here. Not yet. For Kamai, however, it mattered little. As the session adjourned, so too came his time to make his acquaintances with the great tycoons of Guangdong, as he perfectly expected. They were the ones to submit to unease, not him. Masashita's nods were brief, curt, as if he it could somehow conceal the trembles in his handshake. Marita didn't even bother to iron out the disdain and apprehension tinging in his che cheery greetings. And Li Kaxing, the local isn't it? Couldn't even finish a sentence without stuttering or reaching for his drenched forehead. What great men to work with. And then there's Abuka Masar, self-proclaimed visionary, striding forth with a shitting grin plastered on his face. Welcome to the Legislative Council. His shrill, booming voice froze into a whisper. His mouth grazed Kamai's ears. You know what you're here for. I didn't let you in to do anything funny. To this, Komai had to stifle a chuckle. Rest assured, gentlemen. He raised his voice as he'd done again and again and Mongyo's cramped conference halls. Only this time, all of Guangdong shall make his audience his subjects. We have a mandate to fulfill, don't we? It had barely been a day since Lam Hao Chun retreated from his brief respite back home. Here he was again, wrapping up yet another extended shift of Koshu's concrete jungle, mind still lingering on the tense villages of tense up visages of Ma, Uncle, and everyone else. But it only took a mere minutes before a fellow constable's winded pants jarred from his lethargy. Oh, people arguing in the market, and I can't speak any Japanese. As they jogged into the team of market, Lam could see a disheveled shopkeeper shouting animatedly in pidgin chap Japanese, his smudged apron contrasting with the modern dress worn by the Japanese woman. A few fellow officers nodded as Lam approached, pushing away the crowd in front of a bent in Bing suit. Break it up! Lam yelled in Japanese. The woman turned towards him while the shopkeeper threw up his hands and walked into the darkened shop. I'm off. I'm sorry, officer. Hayashi. It's Sukawa Yoshiko from the Kantan Fujin Koran. I, I was just doing my job asking questions, but all of a sudden he stopped, started yelling. Lam looked at the Bing suit filled with people and empty tables. Wait for your station search for her. You ever think you were stopping him from doing his job? Answering your questions isn't going to make his customers happy or put money in his pocket. Do you know any Cantonese? Yoshido shook her head and Lam struggled not to roll his eyes. I'm not surprised. You might want to start from there. Du le mo le mo. Jack Bunzai. Lam froze as he turned to see what the shop owners stormed back outside. Venting his fear, Lam's colleague turned on him aghast. Your shooter turned to Lom, and what does that mean? Don't worry about it. Move along now. Isn't that one that means fuck your mother? I think I remember from the last event. That was on about. <sighs> How's it going over there? I think I want Spears Germany to win, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Because if Spear Spears Germany wins, we can open up trade with them. I mean... I don't know who I give the edge to right now, actually. A, day, a few days after Yoshiko's disastrous interview at the market, she was... Called to me for editor at the start of the workday. Feeling trepidation running along her sp spine, she straightened out her blast and walked under the fluorescent lights, making her way towards the back office. Sit down. Takashi to Koichi motioned to the chair opposite the desk, so Shiko entered. His gray jacket tailored to his stocky frame, softened by somewhat by middle age. How was the interview? I'm sorry. I haven't much success. People don't want to talk to me, and I can't speak Cantonese. I understand. Locals aren't easy to approach, even dangerous if... You don't speak the language. 
And doubtlessly so, given her Japanese. But I can't have you being helpless forever. Yoshiko felt a face flush in embarrassment. Of, of course. Luckily for you, I have a friend in the Guangdong police, and he's agr agreed to loan us an officer to serve as your minder when needed. You should get used to dealing in favors, Yasukawa. It'll do. Excuse me. Two knocks at the door heralded the arrival of the police is his minder, and Lam Hyo Chung stopped dead as Yoshiko turned its direction. Hello again. Officer Haishi. You do know each other. <clears throat> 27 February, 1964. Matsuaki Takuji was gone, liter likely hurried into yesterday's mindful mi midnight flight to Tokyo, taking whatever Yasuda marked pla placards left scattered on the Leco complex floor with him. But no matter. He would not be missed, for the honorable members of the Legislative Council, the ones standing at the apex of Guangdong's pyramid, have far greater mind matters to attend to. The gavel struck one by one. Each of the 100 gentlemen rose to their feet, waded to the podium, and cast for sacred vote onto the gray metal ballot sitting atop. Unassuming it, glaring down upon the seat of bobbing heads be below in silent pride, each little slip of paper was a handshake made. Handshake made over a fat stack of 100 yen notes, well received, perhaps. Each vote a thrust of fate. The tip of the scales towards directions unknown. Upon a spect the spectacle, Marita Aikyo watch, clenching his interlocked hands tighter and tighter. Li Kashing, his companion, bre breathed into his sweating palms. Matsushita Mashiharu kept his eyes to the front, hands on his knees, as still as a statue. Ibuka Masaharu's eyebrow. Alls darted from one corner of the hall to another, and to this all Kamai Kenichiro, the Manchurian outsider, gratuitously offered his amused smile, as this veil of silence and anxiety draped over the halls and streams of suits and ties flowed on to flowed on and on. Only one only more and more granting did the ultimate question grow. Who among the three candidates shall claim the helm? Which among the three possibilities, the three paths towards the future, shall the state of Guangdong, this jewel of the South, embark on for decades to come. No matter the results, no matter what comes after, the stage has been set. Today, Guangdong returns to embrace of its tycoons. Today, the da dance macabre clamors to its crescendo. And now, this council declares Guangdong's chief, next chief executive to be. So final dealings must be sorted out before vinyl victory can be determined. The commander who holds most seats in the legislative council shall be given an additional edge for the race, which shall be added to the final tally. In the event of a dive, the next chief executive will be selected purely based off of who holds a plurality in the legislative council. So, oops. Natsushita has an extra edge. Hoping everything we did works out here. <clears throat> Matsushita Masaharu. It was at the unmistakable sound of his name blared across the hall that decades of accumulated etiquette began to work its magic through Matsushita. First to manifest was a mild cheek-to-cheek -cheek smile, an exhibit of sincere appreciation of the approval of his peers. Next, the almost mechanical gesture of standing up amidst a mechanical applause of fellow Matsushita associates, and the subsequent stride across the row of seats. Limbs coordinated to a fine-tuned cocktail of enthusiasm and restraint, the perfect display in front of disappointed glares from the other corners of a complex. Such were one Tried and true procedure after another, etched deep and within his muscles by the huddled of meeting hundreds of meetings and banquets. And why Matsushita mused as he reached the aisle, should any of his coronation, should his coronation as Guangdong's next chief executive, be any different? Yet as he began his advance towards the center of the hall, something within him began to crack. Somehow he felt inexplicable tremors r rippling through his legs, e even as his every step remained nothing but confident. Somehow, he felt a stream of lead coursing through and weighing down his spine. Even his posture maintained a perfect 90-degree angle. Beads of sweat began converging upon his forehead uninvited, 
barely concealed desperation as gays dance from attendee to fellow attendee, from brooding Morita Akio to sneering Ibuka Masaru. But probe as he might, the source of his undescreptable fright continued to elude him, till the moment he ascended to the podium and turned to face the 99 constituents of Guangdong's legislative apparatus. And then finally came to him. He was afraid. Afraid of incompetence, of ruin, of fall failing the fate of millions now burdened upon his shoulders, crashing his family name to the ground. For one single instance, the illusion of composure dropped and shattered into thousands of broken, flying shards. For one single instant, Masaharu, Masaharu, the scared child, scrambled for the microphone, the wrinkled yet stern visage of his foster father haunting his mind once more. It is my utmost honor. Take this mantle of leadership. We salute Chief Executive Matsushita Masaharu. <clears throat> Emerging from the period of political instability following the Yasuda collapse, the Guangdong Legislative Council has voted Matsushita Masaharu of Matsushita Electric as a new Chief Executive. The adopted scion of one of Japan's most successful independent businessmen, Matsushita stands as a moderate figure between Guangdong's reformist and corporate hardline factions. His tenure is expected to ensure security through modest reform, while facilitating the continued expansion of enterprise and profit. Matsushita is highly popular among Guangdong's Japanese business community, but his paternalistic approach to governance may alienate many, especially among lower classes. It's just to stability and expansion. Here we are. Look at that. Uh, still don't have a new focus tree. Hmm. So we have a police guy, which is very, very nice. Um, you see the guy, not the war best, not the worst. Akio and Ibuka. Um, I might wait and read all this until the next video. I think. Amor actually seems to be winning. Interestingly enough, it would be good for, for the spear. Lee He's mind never rested. His brain was churning a volcano of new ideas and designs. Whereas other young men dreamed of pretty girls with gentle smiles and colorful clothes, Hyde dreamed of blueprints with sharp lines and electrical notation. When he woke from such dreams, he would tumble out of bed, seize pencil and paper, and try to capture the fleeting images in his mind's eyes. Whether he always had it with him, or whether the days of living within Koshu seems had simply hammered into his head, he had no idea. His inspiration was fed by the many hundreds of after-school visits to manufacturing firms and the insight from the technical journals he devoured. He learned and wrote, and what he wrote went into an empty toolbox he carried with him everywhere. In his gut, he knew that the contents of his brain box were novel and that he had the potential to change the world. High acted upon this instinct. He made some time to visit top firms in Guangdong and offered some, idea, some of his ideas to them. He knew how predatory the companies could be, and he had no illusions about the fact that some of his ideas might be stolen. That was okay. He was very careful to present only the ideas he could live without. They were currency, a means of getting him inside some doors that would otherwise remain closed. Their very best inspiration came from observing the, how the big companies operated. What Hay gained from these visits was made so much sweeter by the knowledge that the companies thought they were coming out on top of the steel. A mine rage like a raging fire. Status Guangdong evolves into the Silicon years. Our approach to policing will evolve into pervasive Kenpai Tai networks. Our focus tree changes to match a sheet on the Silicon years. Sort of laws passed during the sheet of caretaker government have expired. Revised labor standards ordinance has been re implemented. Do our decision delay it? Okay. This is a big tree, Jesus.
So we got some anti-corruption as well as some security stuff over here. Very interesting. Hmm. Over here... Seems to be more economic stuff. This seems to be more economic stuff. Hmm. All very, very interesting stuff, I gotta say. And then this seems to be figuring out assets, it seems. Hmm. Okay, all right. Um, economy stuff over here. This is Legislative Council, it seems. Corruption. This seems to be corruption, mainly. Interesting. Okay. Hmm. Some decent options to improve poverty, even. Well, we got a pretty impressive and a pretty massive tree that we got to look at um, soon enough. I don't think I've seen a tree this big since probably the U.S. series. Maybe in, not since Spears series, honestly. But. We'll have to check this all out next time, because I gotta leave it here, folks. Thanks for always watching, though. If you like, so you like. If not, feel free to dislike. If you want to see more of this kind of feature, hit the sub button for uploads weekdays as well as games on Saturdays. If you have any comments, feedback, concern, leave a comment section below. I read all the comments I get. And I do appreciate any old feedback you might have for me. Um, check out my various links down in the description box below. And yeah, that's it for now, my friends. My name has been Mr. Dog 3 I'll see you next time. Bye bye.